talking BTI today. Uh, thanks for making time to join us. Thanks for taking part. Um, we look forward on the insights that one of them is going to bring to us. Uh, I want to remind you about the disclaimer, which is on the screen. Familiarize yourself with that and, and bear in mind that we're trying to get give you accurate information as accurate as possible. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not always right and, and you should evaluate your own situation before diving into a stock. Um, guys, then the other thing I wanted to remind you of was the Stockbroker of the Year um, survey, which is still active. They've extended it, I think, to the 10th of August. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to fill that in, please fill it in. We do gain lots of insights from the feedback that we get from IntelliDex, and we'd appreciate it if you'd fill that in for us if you haven't done so. Uh, Thomas will post the link in the chat for us, and then I'm going to hand over to Vaughan to fire away. Thank you, Vaughan. Thanks, Sorrel, and uh, welcome everyone. And it's it's nice to um, highlight my name, but the the person who does all the work and makes me look good is Ross. So, Ross, over to you. Just tell me when you want to see the slides, and I'll just take all the credit. But uh, thanks, Ross. Cool. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, as Vaughan and them mentioned, we'll be taking you through British American Tobacco this morning. Uh, they've just come out with results, which were pretty much in line with uh, what everyone's expecting, but uh, there were a few key trends that were um, just highlighted. Um, I think it's pretty common knowledge that the cigarette market is in perpetual decline with uh, volumes decreasing about 3% per year. Um, luckily for uh, British American Tobacco, they can still raise their prices to try and offset that. Although in the US, they seem to be having a bit of trouble with that, with volumes down about 12% for the half year. Um, another thing that was mentioned was illicit cigarettes and vapes, particularly the vapes. Um, management estimates that about 50% of all vapes sold in the US are basically illegal. They aren't regulated and they're coming from companies without approval to do so, uh, which could hopefully provide a bit of a tailwind in the future if uh, the regulate to get involved there. Um, from a valuation point of view, we we see quite a bit of upside. Uh, the stock's been trading sideways for about five years now and uh, keeps and continue to earn. So we're seeing the multiples come down and they can possibly get back to the historical ones as they pay down their debt. Uh, yeah, just to speak on the results, they guided for three to five percent and it came in at four and a, four and a bit. Um, so it was uh, right where they, they guarded. Um, the, the highlight of it was um, the next generation product growth, which was at 29%. 35% uh, of that is, well, vapes were growing 35%, tobacco heating products at about 12, and uh, modern oral at uh, 42%. Uh, they did pause their share buyback at the beginning of the year, so investors are hoping that they resume that at the start of next year. Um, and at the moment, we get uh, quite a nice divvy yield of about 7%. Um, you can go on to the next slide there, Vaughan. Just having a look at the sort of the trends in the tobacco industry, you can see that these this is a company that has high EBIT margins. Uh, BATS has the highest one there at about 44.8, 44.9. Um, and you can see on the charts on the right, I've stolen this from Standard Bank, but it's a nice little charts. Just the composition of revenue that these companies are currently um, with their next generation products with Philip, Philip Morris is the largest at the moment and BATS trying to catch up, but um, Philip Morris is about 30% of their revenue in um, next generation products compared to BATS at about 12 and a bit percent. You can go to the next slide, they won. So this is just uh, just how it's broken down. You can see that the majority of their revenue still comes from cigarettes, and that's going has just gone sideways for a couple of years now, and that's due to the cigarette volumes coming down and, and then offsetting it with uh, price increases. Uh, the chart on the right is a little bit distorted due to modern oral's performance in 2019, but essentially these next-generation products are growing at about 30% uh, a year as a basket. We can get to the next one. So this is just an interesting thing I found while reading through an article. Um, this is this is Philip Morris's product, so it's not British American Tobacco's product, but it just highlights the 
a huge upward trajectory of this of these modern orals. We saw in British American Tobacco's results, theirs was up 42%. And this was the shipping volumes released from by uh, Philip Morris, um, and it showed a 53% increase uh, year on year. So just uh, where the trends are heading, in, especially in the US. Can you go into the next one? Uh, so the big talking point with British American Tobacco was their debt profile. In 2017, they went and bought uh, Reynolds American, which is another cigarette producer, um, for $49 billion. And that's sort of when we started seeing the share price come down. Investors didn't like uh, net debt to EBITDA sitting at around 7%. And now it's management have, um, management have focused very clearly on just trying to reduce this. Uh, currently, it sits in the upper two times, um, and they, they're targeting two and a half by the year end, which they seem to be all on their way. Um, if you just look on the chart on the right, you can just see how it's structured. So the majority of the debt is still 10 years out, so nothing too concerning uh, in the foreseeable future. This is just a uh, pure comparison. The main one's obviously for Philip Morris, and then you've got uh, Japan Tobacco and Imperial Brands, uh, the two smaller players. Uh, you can see British American Tobacco and Philip Morris from the sales, EBIT, and net income or uh, net income numbers, they're all very, very similar. And then when you see, when you go over to the um, multiples, that is about half of what Philip Morris is. So we could see a retraction back to even just a normalized three year number, or even one standard deviation above will provide some upside. Next. Yeah, and then this is just the, the valuation. Um, we obviously see the margins returning to the to normalizing to the mean, and we've got a uh, intrinsic value of 34 and a half pounds, which represents about 32% upside. And then I'll hand over to Sean for the technicals. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yeah, as uh, Ross says, the share has been moving sideways for the last five years, but you can see from the chart there uh, that uh, British American Tobacco is trading far below its 200 day moving average and the long term. Uh, remains bearish. That's that, uh, that little purple line just underneath that uh, descending uh, uh, resistance trend line. In the medium term, the share price is trading just below its 21 day and 40 day moving averages. So, uh, while well, in the shorter term, it's trading within what we call a, a symmetrical chart pattern, so a symmetrical tr uh, triangle. So, in the short term, you know, at this point in time, it can go any which way, either up or down. I saw this morning so far it's trading 0.75% lower. We're around about 602.50. Um, so if there's a breakout above that upper resistance trend line, we should see the share price retest that previous, call it support uh, zone, those two red uh, horizontal lines. That's between 624 and 635. Um, but also on the downside, should the share price break through that short-term uh, ascending triangle, we could see it uh, retesting that support way down there at 596. So, uh, you know, in the longer term, if it does uh, move up, as I say, uh, as Ross says, uh, the, the upside potential is there. Uh, we have that intrinsic value of 801, so it's got a, lo lo a lot of um, upside potential. But in the longer term, the first target would be that 200 day moving average, which is in line with that. Uh, Descending triangle is about 650, and then it breaks through that. We should see uh, uh, 731. Um, this is all confirmed with the MACD indicator. It's, it's still trading in oversold territory and confirms uh, obviously the recent price rally uh, with more price, uh, more upside potential. Um, I would at this point in time, if I don't own the share, I'd rather wait for a confirmation, either a strong breakout, either up or down, to tell me which way the market's going. But yeah, it's got a lot of great, great potential. Uh, as I say, that, that intrinsic value is at 801, and it's got a buy recommendation. So yeah, it'll be on my watch list. Thank you. So, sorry, let me just jump in as well to add a little bit of uh, positivity to it. Issue in this kind of environment, um, I'll happy wait with a 7% dividend yield. So <laughs> that's that's part of why we like it so much. Yeah, so it's dirt cheap. Um, you get a proper dividend. From Sean's picture, it looks like it could get cheaper. Um, I don't know um, if it is going to get a lot cheaper, but certainly looking at it from what Ross analyzed, 
what I wanted to know, Ross, is you said I think 12% of rev their revenue comes from vaping products or new generation products, and the other 88 odd percent still comes from cigarettes. Okay, do, yes. do we know what that split is on, on Philip Morris, for instance? Philip Morris is, it's about their next generation products off the top of my head, it's about 32, 33%. So you take the other half, that's about 68% is still um, still cigarettes. So so they got a, a, a bit of a better dispersion as to, well, well leaning towards new generation products. I didn't yeah. know that those oddles that you were talking about was actually gum. <laughs> it's no, it's it's not gum. It's like what a little. It? It's like a little uh, tea bag. That uh, it's like the old traditional chewing tobacco. They've like put it in a tea bag now, yeah. and you pop it under your lip. It's um, it's getting very very popular. And you just suck on it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it just it just sits there, and then you yeah it gets you the gets you your nicotine craving without uh, putting smoke into your lungs. Okay, great, man. <laughs> okay, let's pop over to the other questions, the serious questions, uh, before we carry on talking nonsense here. Uh, so, in short, the sh the the share is very cheap, um, well valued, and Vaughan's enjoying the dividend yield, uh, which is also important. Uh, let's see what we got here. We've got the stockbroker of the year survey link there where the questions let's see is there a dividend yield comparison across the tobacco companies swadesh says um yeah british american, british american tobacco is about seven percent um then the philip morris is about just over five so it's also pretty good um and then the other two i can't think of on the top of my head but they, yeah, lots of. No, look, there's, a, there's an industry benefit. This is also buying the industry. You know, we're buying the stock, which we, we like the, the best one that we think, but the industry is always attractive. I mean, this is the kind of game that what's interesting to us, if you go back to 2017 when they bought uh, Reynolds and they bumped up their debt, um, most people historically quite liked the debt because you were playing chicken with the regulators. You were saying, well, if you regulate us to death, we're going to have a whole lot of a whole lot of debt and a whole lot of dividends, and you know, you put us out of business. You you sit with the problem. Obviously, that shifted uh, slightly, but I wouldn't expect, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that that kind of environment comes back again. These are the kind of companies that have a low business risk, so you don't want them to have no financial risk. Um, so it's just interesting that yeah, the market's been focusing on debt reduction recently. Oh, thanks. That's a very interesting take, Vaughan. Um, so dividend comparison, then oh, if we just compare dividends, then British American Tobacco, the most attractive out of the lot, we think. Uh, from a valuation perspective, certainly cheap, uh, multiples cheap. Um, and that's why you guys put out a buy recommendation. I mean, I, I don't, don't think there's anything wrong in, in picking up a couple at current levels. Um, and if it does go lower, well, then you could always buy a little bit more. Um, also remember, stage, sorry, yeah. sorry, so I also remember this is a nice rand hedge. So you can't buy Philip Morris unless you, you invest directly offshore. This one you can. So obviously there's a lot of debate about where the rand should be. And we as, as a house think there's nice opportunities in some domestic counters, not all of them, but some of them. But this is a very nice rand hedge as well. So you, you get a twofer. Nice company fundamentally, but also a bit of a rand hedge. I said that exact same thing this morning to a client who had some exposure in CFR and, and BTI and uh, she was wondering whether she had too much of it. And I said, well, the, the, the flip side is you've got some stocks earning in foreign currency. It's great. Uh, it's, it's not all bad. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions. Don't see any. I'm overlooking something. No, guys, you're welcome to to ask your question if you if you have one. If not, then I'm going to remind you about the stockbroker of the year survey. Please, if you haven't completed that, do that for us. We'd we'd appreciate your time. Um, other than that, remember that our derivatives workshop is going to be taking place on the 17th of August. Uh, look out for the invites for that, and please bear in mind I, I will require you guys to register for it. Uh, just so that we we can take, be cognizant of numbers and 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 also know who's going to attend, so that we can prepare properly for you. Uh, it's going to be online, uh, but uh, 
I'd still like to know how many people attend and 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 what's and we'd like to actually have a chat with you beforehand to see what your portfolio looks like and so on and, and how we could build that presentation to value to give you biggest value and punch for your buck or your time. Sorry, uh, sorry. Is, is someone talking in the background? Let's see. Is there anybody with a question? No, I think that's me. There's a little bit of noise. I think it's a pocket call. It seems. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's someone talking behind Ross, man. <laughs> okay. Now it's probably yes, me. Um, you want to say? How easy is it to do a survey? I, I'd be interested to know what percentage of the people on the call have have BTR. Okay, let's let's do that quickly. Uh, let me go here, create one quickly, and then uh, let's see. Focus quickly. while while Sorrel's doing that. You've got your hand up. Maybe they were putting their hands up for owning BTI. Okay, let's see. I've launched the survey. Let's see if it comes. Just tell me when you see it. There we go. Do you own BTI? Yes or no? A lot of people. We've had 14 responses. We've we 26 people left on the call. 50-50 split. Okay, 19 responses. So almost everybody has responded to us. Uh, out of 19 responses, it says just more than 50%. So listen, you 10 guys can uh, pick up a couple of BTIs in the meantime, whilst the rest of us who do own it enjoy our dividends. Uh, but Vaughan and Ross, thank you very much for giving us your insights. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to hosting you next week. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks, Ross. Yes, thanks, man. Bye-bye.